Few racing personalities have ever had the impact on the sport as Sir Henry Cecil, whose long battle with cancer has finally been lost. And here to talk about his life and his work is Bruff Scott. And Bruff, astonishing really that in the final chapter of Sir Henry's life, at a time when health was clearly a major issue with him and visually he looked in many ways uh, terrible at times, that he could fit so much in and achieve so much and leave this huge legacy with Frankel. Yes, it was his final and greatest achievement as a trainer, obviously, but also as a man, because there was the person who'd been the hopeless schoolboy and sort of feckless youth uh, and very sort of foppish, um, uh, teasing trainer. And that la those last images, don't forget, we only saw him, we saw him at, after Royal Ascot. Uh, we didn't see him at the July meeting. We didn't, he didn't come to Goodwood. We saw him just for York when he looked terrible mm. and couldn't really talk. Uh, and at uh, Ascot for the uh, Champions Day when he actually looked even worse. Mm. But both times, uh, the old um, sort of uh, foppish, uh, not bothering uh, artifice was gone because it was too tough. And therefore, while he still was very elegant, he had a remember, big Homburg hat at, 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 at uh, um, both days. But he, you could see the determination uh, in what would become a skeletal face, but he was absolutely determined to go out with the saddle. He saddled uh, Frank on both occasions, and I remember thinking he couldn't possibly, the way he looked, be able to leg the jockey up, but he walked very firmly out uh, with Tom Queeley and legged him up in the saddle at York. And I remember thinking, well, what could he do this at Ascot? Because he looked so much worse mm. then. And he did it again. Uh, and, you know, the, the physical and mental determination to get himself there is quite astonishing. And of course, that secret was behind all the other things, that he was actually very determined. And when he used to sort of say in his sort of a teasy way, oh, well, I'm very ambitious, everyone was sort of, used to think he was playing the fool. But actually he was, he was underneath it all, he was very ambitious, very determined, a terrific driver, and, and, and very competitive, I mean, terribly competitive. But in the early days, Prof, very competitive, very talented, very ambitious but not very successful when he sort of was embarking on life. He wasn't a one-hit wonder. Well, he was, it wasn't an, an early... Um, he wasn't, wasn't a hit at all. I mean, the, the competitive and, uh, uh, and ambition and everything else, that only appeared to somehow link into him when he became assistant to his stepfather, which is stepfather, and sort of thinking... Uh, one of the stories is that Davy was going to be... The, uh, the younger brother was going to be the... Uh, assistant and and and, and um, Henry was going to go and be a blood uh, and then David didn't think he could face being with his 75 year old stepfather and mm. so Henry went but I mean there was no question of him mad keen to be a trainer no. a sort of Aidan O'Brien no. or Michael Stout or Vincent O'Brien if you look at those people from very early days they are really thinking about the ambition of being a trainer that's what they want to do there's no evidence even though he was around he was obviously absorbing it by osmosis but it wasn't though Henry wants to be a trainer you know, at, at all, and when he became, you know, he sort of went round the studs and things, but he was just sort of, uh, as I've said before in places, and my first memory of him and his brother, was when I was sort of a swat at Oxford, and he, and they were both at a thing called the gin and tonic course at, 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 at the Agricultural College, uh, Sancestor, well, it was officially sort of a state management course, uh, and it was a sort of last refuge in those days of the useless sons of the gentry, and these were two archetypal, uh, long-haired, fairly hopeless, uh, smoking, only good at uh, smoking, drinking, and young ladies. Uh, and no one would have rated him then. If you had a room full of people, who of those is going to be a, a, a huge success? Henry would have been last in the list. So somewhere he got this thing, uh, and it was not just to his, but to the world's lasting benefit that he found this trick. And having charted his life, bro, how do you think we did get this thing from this long-haired, hopeless youth to a trainer whose intuitive relationship with a racehorse was surely greater than anyone who had gone before him? I, um, I think he liked it, 
which is very important. He liked the whole idea of what the thoroughbred does, and he obviously he <laughs> he had been around it. And I think one of the things is his this is personal theory. His stepfather was getting old, mm. and sometimes it could be quite a good thing not to be with a very very good trainer because his best days were past. And the moment Henry took over, he changed things. He made it much less disciplined. For instance, the whole deal was, you know, that you could you had to walk a sort of rigid one after the other, and you had a tremendously big deal about the evening stables. Mm. Henry changed all that. He liked to, he didn't have evening stables, he used to wander around, uh, except for when owners came. Yeah. Uh, and they, he liked horses to walk alongside each other. And he's, he used to say, and of course in those days it seemed ridiculous, I want them to talk to each other. He wanted, he wanted lads to laugh, and he liked, he liked it to be fun. And he spread that. And I know Paddy Rudkin, who came from the old school, mm. I remember him telling me, well, you know, I couldn't believe it. And, but it sort of worked. And he, I can remember him telling me, he'd go in to see his wife in the morning and said, I'm working for a madman, <laughs> but, 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 but I like it. Uh, and so he had this trick about him that it could work by changing the old official to, because he was a bit of, he was a rebel, Henry, in that he didn't like the, even though he's an establishment figure, the sort of stiffness of the establishment, you know, and sort of short back and sides in fashion stakes and very sort of stiff tweed coats. And also, I mean, the one thing I did, I found somebody who'd been his fag at, uh, we went to Canford, and he, he hated the fagging system and wouldn't, you know, wouldn't let the chap do anything really. He didn't want, didn't like that rigid, rigidity. Mm. Uh, and therefore he was, he was sort of mates with his, his, his staff in a way. It was, it was an interesting one, talking to them. I mean, uh, when it was really swinging, the, it was a lot of fun, they said that. They were very successful and they laughed a lot. And that's, you know, often the greatest success of all. And perhaps they were never as successful as during that period of utter pomp and dominance that stretch from the Piggott era into the Cawthon era. In that stage, flat racing really was all about Sir Henry Cecil, wasn't it? Yes, and he, it was, uh, often these things take a couple of generations to hit a real peak, like, like a really good, a great football team. You have a really good team and then it gets an even better one. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Noel Merlis is amazing things that were in place. And Henry took over and he took it to a new level. I mean, Joe Mercer was a very good stable jockey, and then Piggott took it in, to a new level. And then Steve Corvin took mm. it to another level. Yeah. And at that stage, all systems were in place. You know, Julie, Paddy Rudkin, Willie Jardine, the assistant, you know, Richard Greenman, the vet, they all knew each other back to front. And therefore, as you know, and the world knows, the thing about training racehorses, it's, 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 you can't make them go any quicker. What you can do, is get the best out of them and it's like a school and make sure that the scholarship candidates are coming through. And of course they had, they were very tough. Mm. All this softness, he was very, very hard. The first canter, the Cecil first canter was faster than any other new market. And you know, Judy used to often lead it. And you couldn't lay up, you know, well, you didn't measure up. And, mm. and, and these, they were elite, you know, going, these are gonna have to be top, top performers. And it certainly was. And we went through that era of reference points and oh so sharps and slip anchors when we had that period of pomp. But he was also a man that knew a lot of difficult times in his life and professionally the trough that he suffered um, would have been career ending for, for many trainers. And so to recover from that and to fight back to the position where he could have a horse like Frankel was quite astonishing. I think, I mean, 2005, seeing him out on the heath when I mean, the sort of second lot would hardly have any horses on it, really, 15 horses or something. People, um, uh, people like they often do, rather sort of wanted to keep out of his way because you feel sort of sad about it. And he loved to persecute himself afterwards. Uh, it was this great story that he was walking away and watching you know, two or three horses go, and as he walked past a young trainer talking to his owners, and he heard the conversation drifting past. Uh, that's Henry Cecil. Should have retired years ago. And, and he had that at the back of his head driving him. But it was a huge slump. It was coming for some time. You can't lose key staff and key owners yeah. without it beginning to go wrong. And then it all went wrong. And it, he had this appalling Annus Miserabilis uh, in 2000 when, you know, his, his brother, his twin brother, 
uh, was, was identical twin brother was dying. Uh, you know, his marriage had broken up. His son had gone with his wife. He, 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 he uh, was, was drinking again. Uh, he had a conviction. I mean, everything was going wrong. And then the horses were beginning to go wrong. Yeah. And then standards slipped. They got viruses and things. In 2005, he had 12 winners uh, and about 30 horses. And, you know, if it hadn't been for the, the Arcos and, and uh, Abdullah teams kept the faith, of course, he would have slipped out. Mm. But they kept the faith, and my, how he delivered. And as you say, he did deliver, delivered ultimately with Frankel. And in that final year of his, um, his career with Frankel, he, he did achieve something extraordinary with an amazing racehorse. But as you said yourself, you can't make racehorses go faster, but you can ruin them. And in, with Frankel, he, he did get everything right, didn't he? He put the seal on this incredible career. Yes, and I think any... Uh, rational study of Frankel, uh, from a professional uh, equine point of view, could see that it would have been very, very easy to mess him up. Mm. Uh, because he was very volatile once he started, he was a two-year-old at one stage. If you overfaced him, he could have really got wrong. Uh, he's a horse who put a lot into his gallops, so he had to be careful on that. Uh, he avoided, you know, he won the guineas, but then Actually, he, he, he did nothing wrong in the way they picked things. It's entirely possible run him in the derby, but he might have won the derby, but yeah. broken down or whatever. And remember, the horse, he had one injury scare. One injury scare, which turned out to be a scare. Mm -hmm. I was assured on Grand National Day he's definitely retired by some know all. So I rang Shane Feathers and always said, well, I just ridden him. <laughs> uh, but no, he, 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 the handling of Frankel, uh, the, which was the culmination of his, his training career, it brought in all the things that Henry knew, the right systems, very quiet. The horses, you know, um, when he came back from the Rollers, they put him in another box, they kicked it down, and kept him apart from others. Had one really adamant rule, they never went and sort of played with him. Uh, never let people near him. The one time he would get very shirty, anybody sort of, sort of started wandering off to Frankel's box. And who is to say they went absolutely right? Because they got through with a top, top horse, it got through three full seasons. I mean, you know, to be champion at three years running is very, very hard. You know, and all the other ones uh, couldn't do it. You know, if you think about it, Mill Reese, Brigadier, Brigadier is the most obvious contender, but he wasn't the champion two year old, my swallow was. Mm. You know, uh, and, you know, he was the absolute champion two year old, three year old, and four year old. And it's an extraordinary performance, uh, and it's, it's, very few careers could ever do that, to actually have a signature sign-off so perfect. Uh, and you know, we will remember Henry Cecil down through, and should do, through those sort of glorious uh, uh, Piggott and Cawthon years. Uh, and then, but you, in the end, you have this uh, now you know, rather uh, cancer-ravaged figure, but absolutely determined to deliver with the best horse we've ever seen.